Uh, so hello again, uh, my name is Dr. Michael David Jackson from Victoria University Wellington and today it's my pleasure to be joined by Grant Morris, uh, Associate Professor of Law at Victoria University of Wellington. So good morning Grant. Hi Michael. Good morning Grant. Um, Grant, a question. Um, obviously COVID is a, 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 an epidemiological issue, it's a virus issue in New Zealand. Um, can you explain to me your your involvement as a, as a, as a law professor joining a, a, this cross disciplinary group? Maybe you could expand on why why you became involved with with COVID Plan B. Sure. So I see the issue as a multifaceted one, which obviously science is at the heart of uh, the issue. But around that, we've also got economics, we've got law, and we've got other issues as well. So much has happened because of this, including you know, very, very severe uh, legal restrictions, very severe economic impacts. I think to be able to get through this crisis as best as possible, we need to draw on the expertise of a number of different fields, while obviously having a central role for health experts. Okay. A, a, a question I guess stems out of that then, in, in terms of the legal implications, what does this, what does a lockdown, as, as a person who's locked down for, for four yeah. weeks and, yeah. and, and it, it, you know, can't leave their home other than some uh, restricted access, what does that mean for, for, for freedom of, of, of movement, for freedom of expression, for, for, mm. for our way of life? Um, and I, and, and and also de debate. I think I think you touched in your article quite recently um, that there seemed to be a very restricted amount of debate around some of these issues. Maybe maybe you could touch on that aspect. Mm -hmm. more. Yeah, I mean it's been interesting because in some ways the lockdown is a suspension of our usual civil liberties, and in some ways some of those civil liberties keep going, but in a more restricted way. So I, I won't get too deeply into the statutes today, but there's three statutes really which allow the lockdown to happen, the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act 2002, the Health Act 1956, and the Epidemic Preparedness Act 2006. So the, the government can bring those in and then operate under them. Uh, and you know, we've seen that they're, they're, they're hugely powerful acts and things that we'd normally be able to do, like freedom of movement, are severely restricted. Uh, also, you know, what's happened under these acts and, and um, other ones is that the police have been given an extraordinary amount of power as well. So this happens and is only supposed to happen in the most dire emergencies. And this is what the, um, the government has decided in this case, that this emergency is dire enough to bring these in. In terms of um, freedom of expression, I think that may be the most interesting one in terms of uh, COVID-19 in New Zealand, because freedom of expression has continued in the sense that we are getting, you know, journalists have been considered an essential service and you are getting viewpoints coming through the media. What I have seen, though, is that there has been less space for dissenting viewpoints, less space for people who are directly I suppose questioning uh, how long the lockdown should go on, whether it should be extended, whether the uh, epidemiological uh, evidence is the only one we should be looking at, case studies from overseas. And there have been a few examples I've seen where stories have briefly appeared in the media and then very quickly after they've disappeared. Uh, so that does worry me a bit. Uh, I mean, on one hand, it's good to see that at least you know, viewpoints can get out, but on the other hand, I'm not sure that different viewpoints are being given, are being treated um, equally. I guess the, the, the immediate question that then comes to mind is, is firstly, what does that do to, to our democracy? What does that do to our future rule of law? I mean, there, there's some, you know, there's some very historic quotes about, you know, once, once organisations take power, it's very difficult to get back a hundred percent of those powers. I mean, what does this mean longer term in, in, in ensuring that once the lockdown is over, we, we get back to where we were and we can we can we can get back that rule of law and we can get back those rights that we previously had. I mean, mm. what effect does this have longer yeah, term? So, yeah. So, I mean, I think everyone's hope, well, most people's hope is that when we go down to different levels, it goes back to what it was. And this, I suppose, uh, these restrictions are, are lifted. And some will be lifted quicker than others, depending on how it relates to the pandemic. I mean, just thinking about the rule of law, though, and again, I won't go into too much detail today, but you know, a lawn full of the famous American uh, legal theorist 
came up with eight elements of a rule of law, and I'll just go through them and just highlight some where you know that they're not really happening in New Zealand at the moment. Um, there must be laws, not just decisions made on an ad hoc basis. Uh, the laws must be publicised. I mean, there's some real issues around in the beginning of the lockdown as to what you, you know, where we find what we can do and what we can't do, and and that that lack of access to to the law. Uh, retroactive, retroactive legislation should be avoided. Laws should be understandable. Again, you know, a lot of people have been confused and, and remain, I think, confused, even though there has been clarification. Um, laws should be consistent with other laws. Laws should not be impossible to obey. Uh, and the rapid changing of laws should be avoided as, a, as it creates uncertainty. And the implementation of the law should coincide with the letter of the law. So a lot of all of that is around consistency, openness, transparency, and um, citizens knowing what they you know can and cannot do. So I think for us the biggest problem around that was probably in those early days where it wasn't clear what was in and what was out. And I think also you could apply that to essential services and non-essential services. You know, it's taken the whole lockdown period for it to be clear as to, you know, which is which and, and the reasoning behind it as well. I mean, if you go deeper into the rule of law, you also get this idea of, um, you know, the, the law coming from the people in a, in, a, in a liberal democracy. And if the law doesn't have any sense to it or is, is not consistent in any way internally, well, then, you know, at what point does the social contract between the individual, the citizen and the government begin to break down because the laws just don't make sense? So, so we got some examples, I, I guess, historically of... You, you said earlier that this is this is this type of state of emergency is only implicated in... in in really important time points in, in history. Have we got some examples of that and how maybe we've recovered in terms of our, our rule of law and our, our freedoms or maybe some knock-on implications where some of those freedoms that we had previously have maybe been subsequently restricted? Are, are we in the unprecedented times here? Is this the is this a first for us? Yeah, I mean, we hear that term a lot, unprecedented. And, and in, in, in relation to pandemics and the rule of law, I mean, I think there are definitely aspects that are unprecedented. But we've got three big examples in our history. Two world wars. Uh, I'm not sure they're the best analogies because a war, everyone does expect some of these restrictions because, you know, you're fighting for your uh, nation's survival and... Um, or at least that's what the perception is. I think the best analogy in terms of how the law was used was 1951 in the waterfront strike. Now, that was done, I think, quite cynically by um, the, Hol um, the Holland government um, in 51, and I'm not saying that you know, the government is doing this cynically, but it was during peacetime, so that's why it's such a good analogy. So I think the justification for restrictive laws and emergency powers is much harder in peacetime than it is in wartime. So um, I think we look to 1951 and say, well, you know, what were some of the mistakes made there and what were some of the things we can learn from that? And I think the most important thing we can learn is that we do this for the shortest amount of time necessary. We don't drag it on. We don't definitely don't drag it on for any political reasons. You know, it has to be absolutely based on you know, the rationale that was set out at the beginning for health reasons, public health reasons, taking into account law and economics. But, I mean, you know, the 51 was done for political reasons, and I think that's given emergency powers a pretty bad name in our history because of that. Associate Professor Grant Morris, thank you for joining me this morning. Cool. Thank you, Michael.